Okay. A um, couple of questions that people asked over the weekend. First, there was a question of whether or not I got the whole um, Ether naming system wrong, which I had to look up myself. Um, because the problem in the book that they gave and what they said generally, they said generally you start numbering at the carbon attached to the oxygen is actually, um, I, I looked that up, that is actually incorrect. So let me, a couple things. The way I did the ether naming is correct on Friday. And when I looked up the, in the blue book, the question, this this one right here that they are naming 1-chloro-2-ethoxyethane is the indication that the numbering scheme I gave you is indeed correct. So, again, you on either side of the oxygen, you look at the number of carbons. In this case, there's two carbons on the left side, two carbons on the right side, but the carbon on the right side has more substituents, so the tiebreaker would be if you had a greater, if you had equal number of carbons on either side, the one with the more substituents is the way we, that's what we would use as the parent name. So this group right here is our, this is our ethoxy group, and then you can see that they numbered it one chloro, indicating that you don't generally number from the carbon attached to the oxygen as number one for the parent chain, okay? So for the parent chain, you do exactly what I indicated, which is you name the parent chain using all of the normal rules, and then you just happen to have an alkoxy group as a substituent. Yeah? Why is it two alkoxy then? Because if I'm numbering, this is carbon one, and that's carbon two, and carbon two is where the ethoxy group is attached. So here's my, this is my longest chain right here, too. So one is chloro, two is then the whole ethoxy group, which is all of that. Okay. Now, the problem they gave in the book was that made it seem like they were numbering everything the same or numbering everything starting with one next to the oxygen was true, but it wasn't characteristic of what we do. So and the compound that they had was something like this. They had a CH3CH2O, and then on the other side they had like a CH2CH2CH2CH3. So in this case, if you were looking at the rule, if you're looking at the rules, we've got two carbons on this side, four carbons on this side, four carbons then becomes the parent chain. So this is the parent chain that I'm going to go ahead and number using whatever rules I need to use. So if there's a double bond in here, we, num we find the longest chain, including the double bond, number from the end closest to the double bond, etc. So in this case, this is a four carbon chain, so this is going to be a butane. And we happen, and this is going to be then my substituent, which is an ethoxide or an ethoxy group. So in this case, because the parent chain has the ethoxy group at carbon one because there's nothing else attached to it. That was the reason why they numbered the parent chain starting at number one attached to the oxygen because in this molecule, that's the way it has to be numbered. But it's not an exception to the rule. It's just the rule. This is a butyl group. It only has one substituent. And so that substituent is attached to carbon one. So this would be a one ethoxy butane would have been its name. Yeah. So an alkoxyl group does not take like or it only does if it's alphabetized first. Okay. And the other thing is 
like if I have a, so if I had something like, if I had something like this, and then I had a, and I had a bromo group there. Again, you got to go back, you have to go back to the rules. So I've got three carbons over here. I've got one, two, three. I've got more than three over here. So now this becomes my parent chain. This becomes what kind of alkoxy group? This is an isopropoxy group. That's an isopropoxy group. In terms of this chain now, I'm going to number from the end closest to the first substituent, which in this case is, this is number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five. So in this molecule, it so happens that the isopropoxy group is attached to carbon one. And so this would be 3-bromo, 1-isopropoxy pentane. So it's not that the isopropoxy group has priority. It just so happens that it's one of those groups that can, add, that can add or can be at carbon-1 at the end of the chain. Like if I take, if I said, well, what kinds of groups can I have here that would be carbon one? Anything but an alkyl group. Because if you say, well, attach a methyl group there, that extends the chain one. So if I put a halogen here, that would automatically be the number one position because that's the end closest to the first substituent. And so the same thing is true here for the isopropoxy. So the example they gave in the book wasn't a good one because it, um, it had the alkoxy group at carbon one naturally. So the way, I, the way I gave it to you is correct. Unfortunately, the blue book only has that one example. They, they only have this one example of the one chloro two ethoxy, um, but that's that's the way it's named. So I don't know what they meant by generally, unless they're only going to have the alkoxy group at like the end of the chain. Now what they may have been talking about was if you use the IUPAC method of naming an alkyl group because in that case, that carbon would be number one in terms of its numbering scheme. So I had to look at that. I'm like, really? Did I go through and completely mess it up in both classes? No, I didn't. And I checked the end, and they said 49, 40, uh, question 49 was, I checked the answer. It was the one I think I circled in class. So and in the video. So it so that's that's the rule. The alkoxy group has no standing no more standing than an alkyl group or a halide. So that that was that was the one that was one question. The other question was so for top hat gives you matching problems are you going to see matching problems on the exam? I would say probably not. So I do have a set, I do have a complete set of naming practice problems, and I will come up with some more as well. So my, my suggestion is when you're naming, when you're doing the problems in Top Hat, you know, if you have a molecule, name it first, and then see if that name is there, as opposed to trying to hunt and peck as to which one is correct. I understand there's a system of doing multiple choice problems, but 
typically if you answer the problem and then look for the answer, that's a little bit better way of doing the problem than just trying to pick and choose. What other questions did you have? ACL compounds. So there's a whole bunch of different ACL compounds. Okay. I was just going to say there's there's with you when you have a carbonyl compound, um, this group can either be called if you're just talking about the CO double bond, you can call that a carbonyl group. Some people call it an acyl group. Um, I prefer carbonyl, but I can see acyl. And then on one side of that group, there's usually a carbon. And on the other side, there is the group that makes that functional group have a particular name. So if it's an if it's an H, it's an aldehyde. If it's another carbon, it's a ketone. If it's an OH group, it's a carboxylic acid. So when you're looking at those functional groups, you will typically have a carbon on one side, and it's this group that tells you what the functional group is. Okay. So if we're looking at so if I'm looking at this table, um, and I don't think I can write on this table. Yeah, 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 yeah. Done. Okay. Okay, so when you're looking at this functional, when you're looking at this So when you're looking at the functional group, as you look at this, um, we need to talk about a couple of these, um, the, way the, the way this table is laid out. So there's two types of suffixes, a suffix and a prefix when the molecule is, depending on whether it's um, the highest priority or whether it's not. So the first column is if that group is the highest priority precedence in the molecule, that group is then labeled according to the column one in terms of its suffix. But if you have enough, if it's second priority, then it's called something else. Um, and so that's what's on the second table here. So if you look at the carboxylic acid, the carboxylic acid actually has a couple of different ways of looking at this. So both of these right here are C double bond O OHs. Okay. So what this boils down to is the and, and I, they didn't quite explain why they use brackets and why why some have brackets and some don't have brackets. The brackets go with the non-cyclic names and the non-bracketed go with cyclic compounds is the way I believe that this works. Yeah, uh, sorry, the first one, yeah, th these with the non-brackets go with a cyclic compound and those with the brackets go with a non-cyclic compound. And I'll have to show you an example of, of either one of these. So 
the groups that are at the top of the list. And there are some that we're not going to deal with. We're not going to deal with the sulfonic acid. We are, well, we, will, we can deal a little bit with anhydrides. Um, esters, so these functional groups right here are esters. So they are a C double bond O with an OR group on the other side. Uh, carbonyl, these are C double bond O's with an X, meaning a halogen atom. They're called carboxylic acid chlorides and bromides. We're not going to deal with those um, now. We'll deal with those next semester. Um, amides. This is an amide, which is a C double bond O with a nitrogen group on the other side. Nitriles are the C triple bond ends. This greater than sign is, I don't know, it's a C double bond O. This is a ketone. This is a ketone functional group. Um, then the OHs are alcohols. We won't deal with thiols, and we will deal with the means. So in terms of the functional groups, this is how I would modify that chart to simply say, and this, this anhydride is a C double bond O with an O with another C double bond O on the other side. So again, on one side of the carbonyl, you've got an alkyl group on the other side you've got that functional group. And I would give you if, you, if you're writing this on your chart, I will give you a chart with these things written on them. Okay, I'll modify the chart so that, so that you can do that. Because without doing that, it becomes, this chart becomes a little bit harder to use than it should be. Okay. So if, you, so if we want to name a carboxylic acid, the first thing that we should do is when you look at the groups at the top of the chart, they're all groups where there's a chain of carbon atoms and the, carbon, the C double bond O always occurs at the end of the carbonyl. So all of those groups, ex well, except nitrile, but aldehydes, carboxylic acids, they have to occur at the end of the chain because one is a carbon and the other is a non-carbon group. Okay, so if you, if you look at that, then that helps you say, oh, well, those have to be higher priorities. And carboxylic acids have the highest priority. So when we're looking at a carboxylic acid, let's say we just write carboxylic acid, um, I'll put a double bond there just to make it a little more interesting. So when you look at the carboxylic acid, I've got a carboxylic acid versus a double bond. I look at my chart, which one has the higher priority? The carboxylic acid does. By definition, we have to number at the carboxylic acid as carbon number one. So this would be carbon one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay. I've got a double bond between carbons five and six, and I've got a bromine at carbon four. So the first thing is aldehydes, C double bond O's with H's, carboxylic acids, esters, by definition, they get the number one spot in the naming. So in this case, this is going to be a 4-bromo, and then the question is, what do we do with the 7-carbon chain? This is 4-bromo-hept to indicate that it's a 7-carbon chain. If this was didn't have the double bond, it would be heptanoic acid which is what's in the chart. Um, if you look at this chart, you would see, where's my chart? Where's my drawable chart? So you would see that this is, this would be an heptanoic 
acid. Now, this is not going to be a heptanoic acid. This is going to be a heptanenoic acid because it's got the double bond in it. So we would again go back to our rules of number, suffix, number, suffix. So in this case, this would be a hept 5 ene. And then you might say, okay, this is going to be a 1 oic. But because carboxylic acids are always at number 1, you don't have to put the number 1 in. Also, you notice I didn't draw the E. Because E's next to O's in names are frowned upon. So if you have an ENE -E that's going to have an OIC or an O8 or an OL for alcohol attached to it, you drop the E. If you have the E in there, it's fine. If you put number one for the OIC, that's fine with me, but really it would be 5 hept, it would be hept 5 en oic acid. And so on packing that name, we've got a 7 carbon chain. The first carbon is the carboxylic acid, that's what the oic acid stands for. And then there's a double bond between carbons 5 and 6 with the double bond in it. Well, first of all, we'd have to know that this stands for a carbo... We'd have to know that that stands for a carboxylic acid, and then we would have to know a carboxylic acid looks like that. So there was a whole list, a whole table of functional groups that were in last that were in Friday's reading and so you have to you have to kind of know that that's what it would be now in this case you would have your chart to work off of so you would go oic acid you would come up here oic acid is a COOH group which is C double bond OH so I would put that on the chart so you would be able to work backwards from that if I gave you the name. And then if I gave you the functional group, you would come up here and go, oh, that's a carboxylic acid. The, this is a non-cyclic one, so you use the bracketed C, and then it becomes, that's the suffix is OIC. And then for those ones, it's automatically, this is automatically number one. So it's automatically at the end of the chain. Yeah. Okay. If it's lowest precedent, I don't know when you would use carboxy because I there's no situation we're going to be in where the carboxylic acid is going to have a lower precedence. Now, let's deal with the other part of this, though. The car so if, if the bracket is non-cyclic, then the non-bracket is cyclic. So what does that mean for that molecule? Let's say I gave you this molecule where you had this molecule that they gave you in top hat. So we look through the ring, we look through the ring system and we see that the carboxylic acid group has the highest priority. Now, what does that mean in a cyclic system? That means that carbon is automatically number 1. So whatever group is the highest priority gets number one in a ring. So then we would look at this and we would say, okay, that's number one. 
Now I'm going to number either clockwise or counterclockwise. And if there was another functional group in there with a lower priority, I would go clockwise or counterclockwise to give that next highest priority group the lowest number. In this case, there isn't. There's just a bromine, and it has no standing. So now I'm just going to number clockwise or counterclockwise to give till, till I find my first substituent. Okay. So as I said, I think I said on Friday in, I don't know, one of the two classes, that if you have groups with no priorities, that's when you number to give the lowest total sum of substituent numbers. But the minute you have a group that has a priority higher than, meth than alkyl groups, alkoxies, and halogens, that group gets number one, whatever the highest priority group is. So in this case, I would go two and three because I want to give the bromo, that's the first substituent, it gets the lower number. Okay. So the, in a ring system, this is going to be a 3-bromo cyclohexane. And now, because it's a ring, you use that suffix that's appropriate for the ring, which is now this one, the one that doesn't have a bracket around the COH. So this name would be 3-bromocyclohexane carboxylic acid. So it, it doesn't become cyclohexanoic acid. That's not the way IUPAC structured it. They structured it to say that it's cyclohexane carboxylic acid. Okay. So that's why there's two entries on the chart. Okay. And it, it took, well, I know enough about these names to know that for an aldehyde, there's a thing called a carbaldehyde, and the carbaldehydes are the C double bond OHs, that are attached to the ring. So that's how I'm able to figure out on the chart what they mean by brackets and not brackets. So what I need to do is pull this, I need to pull this chart apart and put in a couple more columns. Like ring, no ring. Cyclic, acyclic. But if you're using the chart, which you will always have the opportunity to do, then you would look at that and say, okay, this is a this is non-ring, this is ring, so it gets a carboxylic acid. If there was some other group in there that had a higher priority, it would become a carboxy group. But I just don't know what group that is. Okay. So carboxylic acids and aldehydes all have to be at the end of the chain. And you do not have to put the one in because it's understood that that is the number one position. Just like for this 3-bromocyclohexane carboxylic acid, if you put a one carboxylic acid with me, that's okay. But it doesn't have to be there because it's automatically understood that the carboxylic acid is number one. What else? Can you do um, the examination of the acid and hydride as the... Okay. So, I don't know if the book does asymmetrical anhydrides or not. And there is an issue with anhydrides about common name versus IUPAC name. 
So let's take something simple. Last week, when we made our triboluminescent crystals in lab, we used this anhydride. Right? And that was called, this was acetic anhydride. Now, acetic is a common name. that hasn't quite been accepted by IUPAC. They still have a difference between, between common names and IUPAC names in the carboxylic acids. So a, this acetic anhydride is what's called a carboxylic acid anhydride. These are all second semester reactions but here is actually how you get an anhydride. The way you get an anhydride, the name anhydride means without water. You take two carboxylic acids and you lose water to make the anhydride. So it's called a carboxylic acid anhydride um, simply because it's two carboxylic acids without water. And we'll talk about that whole reaction and everything towards the end of the year. So the question is what acid, what carboxylic acid or what carboxylic acids did this anhydride come from? And in this case, that anhydride came from a two-carbon acid, which is called acetic acid. An acetic acid is the major acid, well, it is the acid in vinegar. And that's kind of how it was named. You might say, well, what about the one carbon acid? The one carbon acid is called formic acid. And it got its name because if you take ants and you squish them, you get formic acid. Then a three carbon acid, they weren't very creative with because that's called propionic acid, which could double as with the prop, that could, that could um, double as an IUPAC name. And then the four carbon acid is called butyric acid. because butyric acid basically is what you get when butter goes rancid. So that's why they call it butyric acid, because it has a rancid butter smell. Like, it's bad. I've barred it. I've barred it from all second semester experiments now. But there was a time when we didn't. So, I mean, like, take a baby diaper and let it ripen. And that's butyric acid. It's bad. It's very bad. So we've gotten rid of that as an experiment. Um, and then it goes on to valeric and some of the other acids. But these are all common names. The acetic one, I wish they just would accept. Because if they accepted it, everybody uses acetic acid anyway. No... We'll use them in lab. The only one we're going to really use is acetic acid. Next semester, we'll use these other ones as we're making esters, but that's next semester. So the only one that we, that we use a lot is acetic acid and acetic anhydride. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say here with the anhydrides is that if you have the same carboxylic acid on both sides, you can call this acetic anhydride because it's the anhydride from two molecules of acetic acid. Now, if we wanted to name this by the IUPAC method, acetic is not accepted, so it becomes ethanoic acid. Would be the, would be the IUPAC name 
for carboxylic acid, that's ethanolic acid. Just like for esters, it would be ethanoate. So when you go to the chart then, and you look at the acetic acid, you see that it's an OAC anhydride. And so if I asked you to draw, if I asked you to name an anhydride, it would be symmetrical on both sides. And so for instance, let's do a three carbon. So if we had the three carbon acid on both sides, this would be propionic anhydride. So in their, so in their kind of introduction to naming here, we're going to only do anhydrides that are symmetrical on both sides. So the ONIC would be the, sorry, nope, sorry, prope, sorry, prope anoic anhydride. Propionic anhydride would be the common name. So prope anoic, so let's get rid of the, there, prope anoic would be the correct name for this. Are acid and anhydrides like interchangeable in their forms? Or are the ones with ethanoic acid? Um, if this was propanoic acid, it would look like this. If it was propionic, if it was propanoic anhydride, it would look like this. So the only difference between what goes here is whether it's a C double bond OH, which is the acid, or C double bond O with another carbonyl group on the other side, which is the anhydride. So that tells you what you have. Did they do unsymmetrical anhydrides? Of course they did. So what would be, okay, so what would be the Do you remember what problem? Well, never mind. We just go here. So there it is. Stop. There. So there's propanoic anhydride. So in terms of the naming then, how would we figure that out? Just from looking at this picture right here, what rules is this following from before? It looks to me like I have an oxygen with two things on either side, kind of like an ether. See that analogy? So what were our rules for the ethers? One, pi one part became a substituent, and the other part became the parent name. How did we decide that? Based on the total number of We decided one was a parent, one was a substituent based on the total number of carbons. So in this case, this has a five carbon chain. This one only has a three carbon chain. And so what they've decided to do is they've decided to basically name each side of the oxygen. But who comes last? <laughs> the last alphabetized one. So actually they didn't use the con they didn't break the chain they didn't break it up so I'm making it more complicated than it needs to be let's go back up two minutes here's what you do name this side name this side 
Put them together alphabetically and hydride. That's the name. So is there a problem? Oh good, it even has substituents on one of the sides. So let's so let's look at this one. There's four of them there. We'll just do one. Okay, so what's the name of this molecule? All right, what do we, so we're going to have this side, and we're going to have this side. So we have to name the two of them. All right, what would be the right-hand side name? I've got one, two, three, with no substituents. So that side would be propanoic. So the OI, the ANOICE means that it's no double bonds or triple bonds, just single bonds, and the OIC means that it came from a carboxylic acid, which is where anhydrides come from. So that one's propanoic. What's the other side? And what did I just do? I just showed you you have to number from the end from the carbonyl. So that is what? That is butanoic with a methyl group at carbon 3. So that's a 3-methylbutanoic. The only question is who comes first. In this case, it doesn't matter. Because M or P, or sorry, M or B beats a P. Are you going to ask what would happen if that wasn't the case? I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know. My guess, my guess, purely my guess is that, no, I don't, I don't have a guess. I don't have a guess. So I guess we'll just have to stick to problems where it doesn't matter. Or I'll have to look up something else from the blue book. So in this case, 3-methylbutanoic, propanoic, and hydride. So which one is that? That looks to me like that's A. And this is a throwaway because it's not an ester. And the rest of them, 2-methyl, no. 3-methyl three uh, three propanoic, no. The propanoic's on the other side, so that's A. On an exam, since there's a, this ambiguity, if I gave you something like this, or if I gave you something like this in the homework problems, you can do your best to alphabetize. It's not, I wouldn't take off points if there was one or the other. You just have to name both sides. In the common name system, since there's no rules for common names, you can name it any way you want. There's no alphabetization rule. 
But in this case, I don't honestly know whether it's M or B. If I put it in brackets, it would be an M. It might, it very well might be the B. Because you're looking at parent chains on both sides. Otherwise, it's going to be a nightmare. So that's my guess. I'll make a guess there. So you just name, name the groups on either side. But you're naming them as if they're carboxylic acids, but then you're leaving the acid name out. So we have to start numbering at the carbon, at the carbonyl. So it's not like alkoxies. Alkoxies, you've got to decide who's going to be the substituent and who's going to be the longest chain. What other ones were you? Esters? Did you get the scheme for esters? No, I guess no. Esters. So I always start out esters like this. You need esters are named according to how they are traditionally made. So you traditionally make an ester by taking a carboxylic acid and reacting it with an alcohol. Next semester we'll do this. This is one of the experiments we'll do in lab. Just to complete the reaction, you need something like sulfuric or pho phosphoric acid as a catalyst. And what will happen is you will end up losing water in the process to form the C double bond O, and then I'm going to write that in red because that's the part that came from over here. The alcohol. Okay. So the alcohol part is the O is the RO group, and the other part came from the carboxylic acid. So that you need to know that because that's how these things are are named. So this is actually what's called a Fischer esterification reaction. We'll learn about that next semester. But if you're going to name an ester, what you need to do is you need to name the alcohol part first. So in other words, I need to know what the name of that alkyl group is. That's what comes first in naming an ester. So let's do an ester. Uh, let's take something like this. Oh, let's see. Let's do something. Let's do something straightforward. And I'll add another carbon there. So we look at this OR group over here, and we say, what is the name of that alkyl group? And you would say, isobutyl. got four carbons in it with an isogroup, that's isobutyl. What's on the other side? Carboxylic acid. How do I name that? Like a carboxylic acid. One, two, three, four, five. There's my five carbon chain. So what would be the name of that group? That would be a pent well, it would be a 3-methylpent group. 
So the way we name this is, first of all, it's an isobutyl group, and then it's a pent tan. Now, if this was truly, if the left-hand side was truly a carboxylic acid, it would be pentanoic acid. It is not, because it is a 3-methyl pent and it would be 3-methyl pentanoic acid, but it's not, it's an ester. So the suffix for an ester is O-A-T-E. So this would be a 3-methyl pentan O8. So looking at this, isobutyl means the group attached to the oxygen is an isobutyl group. The other side that came from the carboxylic acid is a 3-methyl pentan O8 group, but it's O8 because it's an ester. Yeah, you name this you name this up to that point how you're naming the acid, only instead of OIC it becomes OATE. Okay, so that's how you would name esters. I think I answered a question on that. All right, so I will put together some problems. I think there's one more thing of naming because now we should put them all together, but we kind of have for Wednesday. So I'll bring some problems and maybe we'll kind of work in groups and do those. Or I will answer any questions, put them up on Piazza, send them to me on email, and we'll finish this up on Wednesday.